Thanks, I'm, I'm conscious that you've all been um, tweeting and asking questions and discussing and reacting even inside your own heads to so much of this very rich set of insights that have been presented to us today. Um, I'm, one of the things that really struck me was um, the importance of the student role and student partnership and um, student leadership in a whole range of ways. And the National Forum is really committed to this. I think it's important to recognise that this was a very singular exercise in looking at where leadership within the institutions are right now. All the, uh, and everybody has reminded us, everybody on the panel has reminded us that this is in the wider context of a whole network of projects and work that's going on. So the student voice is being gathered and absorbed through a whole range of different media, not just within your own institutions, but also very, uh, there's a real commitment to that at um, national forum level. And I think that in the round, all of those pieces are going to be enormously important. So we're shining a spotlight today on a particular set of perspectives. And I'm really grateful to our panel for really pushing our thinking, not just the thinking of everybody in the room, but particularly the thinking of the National Forum, the language that we're using, the lenses through which we've seen issues, the way in which um, problems are presented. And Fiona and Mark and many of you on the panel have reminded us how important language is. So much of what we achieve through the National Forum is 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 through language, is through conversation, both formal and informal. And we, while we have to be careful about the language that we choose for official documentation, I think we also have to be effusive and transparent and authentic in the way we engage with one another, or we're not going to get to those real heartfelt issues that Larry talked about um, and that Jim said, you know, we, we, it's not just the stuff that we put in the reports, it's our instincts. We are committed to a very strong evidence base and that's got to be a very important driver. But on the other hand, everybody tells us that teaching and learning is highly contextualised, highly intuitive, highly responsive within very specific environments. And if we leave that all behind, then we're missing something extremely valuable and important. And we're losing the essence and um, the heart and soul that Larry so articulately referred to. I'm going to take a little bit of time. I know we've gone over time a little bit, but I do want um, to give a chance to give voice to some of the questions and issues coming out from the audience and perhaps, and I hate to put Sean O'Reilly on the spot, but because, is he, and he's at the back of the room listening and attending and participating and has been a huge ally to the National Forum's work too. Um, but there, there was a question that did come through about how some aspects of the report may suggest that, for example, VLEs in, used in particular ways may not be mission critical to um, uh, at undergraduate level to students and it would be really useful perhaps to hear from Sean about what Izzy might be suggesting in that regard. I don't know if you if you want to talk off the cuff or perhaps feed into this discussion when we... Um, okay. yeah, that'd be great Sean, yeah, thank you. Thank you Sarah, yeah. I'm certainly listening more intently in the last 10 seconds or so. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point, yeah. I, su I suppose relatively from the point of view of the Irish Survey of Student Engagement, it's important to actually recognise that when fieldwork finishes at the end of this month, we will actually have three years of national data based on what students are actually telling us. So amongst all of the many other elements around the structure and context and policy and the overall planning of the national survey, it's a survey. We ask students questions and they respond. And in 2014, almost 20,000 students responded. And so far in 2015, it looks, although we're not at the end of field work yet, that we will be looking at an increase. Now, there are a lot of questions in the survey, and there's another whole discussion around that. But there are two particular questions which may well in, um, contribute to the discussions today. One is a question asking students how much their experience at their institution has contributed to them developing knowledge, skills, and personal development in terms of using ICT. Now, in 2014, 65.5% of students who responded responded positively to that question. There was a second question asking students how much they have used an online learning system to discuss or to complete an assignment. So in many ways, that question may well offer more valuable insights into what's actually happening. But again, 65.3% percent of students who responded to the survey in 2014 said often or very often in terms of responding to that particular question. So it strikes me that perhaps 
at the heart of many of the contributors today was the point that there's perhaps quite a bit happening on the ground, but how we make that visible um, at a whole variety of levels within the institution may well um, be an issue to ponder for in the future. Thank you, Sean. A much more structured response than I would have expected, having, having literally sprung that on you. But, Sean, thank you. Thank you for that. I think it's really interesting to hear some of what Fiona tells us about the assumptions around initiation, response and feedback that might still prevail among certain students and how, uh, pr uh, and how we really get a reality check about what those um, assumptions might be in terms of how people re report their experiences of learning. So thank you for that. Um, just moving very quickly then to some of the questions um, arising, particularly from, uh, from Larry's piece. Uh, I, I think there's been a huge interest, as evidenced by the kind of the Twitter feed and about the questions coming in. But ca one of the key ones, and I won't go through them all and we'll tabulate everything anyway, but can uh, QA cover encouragement of HR processes to ensure teaching is valued equally with research? that parity of esteem issue that's, that's always been there, that we often lament, that people um, recognise as a, as a real challenge. Um, how uh, can, can QA uh, be aligned in a way that addresses the parity of esteem issue? I don't know, Larry, if you want to say anything to that straight away. Okay, again, I'm going to say that's not the role of QA. Yeah. The greatest culprit in that is ourselves. Uh, we do not, our identity, particularly with academics, still lies with our discipline. Uh, we, we tag on the role of educator as a, an afterthought. Uh, I think it's been articulated here extremely well that uh, we now need to recognise that the profession we're in is a prof as a professional educator first. Our discipline comes second. It should serve the needs of our role as professional educators. So the reason it's not recognised, I would argue, is we've contributed to that because we want recognition in our discipline. That's why, and it's interesting, I noticed in the QA where the, the, there's a bit of an argy-bargy whose accreditation is more important, your professional body's accreditation or the QA authorities. And what they're aspiring to do is ensure that they minimise the effort we have to go through in order to accredit the programmes. At the, most, at the minute, some of us go through two or three variations of accreditation, all for the same programme. So to answer the question, I think the solution that's in our hands uh, we need to be bold, we need to shape the vision for professional educators and I think what I see and all the evidence I get and I'm very privileged at the moment working within the TU for Dublin support team, all of it there cries out for the professionalisation of our role as educators, first and foremost. The rest of it is secondary. But that's, that's my opinion, I'm, by I'm the way. Sure that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody wants to just any other comments on that? I'm just going to quickly run through, um, again, just picking up on a few key questions. Coming uh, to Mark's uh, insights on developing a shared vision and goals for digital learning, and for, again, really pushing us to think carefully about not just the metaphors that we're using, but the kinds of actions that might arise from, um, from uh, a vision that's already been declared through, for example, the national strategy. Um, this is a kind of an impossible but rather seductive question that came in uh, through Twitter, what is the one action leaders could take to release academic staff to be more flexible? A, it feels like a holy grail question, but it, it, it feels invested in passion as well. I don't know if, um, Mark, you want to respond to that in a way that, or, or, or maybe reflect on it. I don't think I have a, a, a magic bullet no. in my pocket. Um, no. But for me, probably space is as much a metaphor. So it's not about physical space, it's about cognitive space, mental space. So providing the space to be innovative. Um, and that links back into not the individual, but the culture, um, the subcultures within your institution. Thank you, Mark. That's, I, I think, another important insight. Um, Fiona, who talked about the unit of change and who brought, I think, a really interesting perspective on the disciplinary uh, commitment and orientation to teaching and learning innovation. Um, I, I guess uh, one of the really challenging things that came through, and I'll just focus on one question, is why um, uh, is there this, uh, is it possible for department or faculty level um, innovations to break out of their silos? Is this discussion about signature pedagogies that suit particular disciplines um, perhaps 
some way of segregating uh, what could actually be united at a, at a more collaborative level? Is, and is there something about an anomaly to do with that paradox that you might want to talk to a little bit, Fiona, in the light of what you told us? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there's a huge amount of space to break out of our disciplines, and I think we do that in all sorts of ways. Um, within our institutions, outside of our institutions, around teaching and learning projects, um, within communities of practice, we have wonderful communities of practice within our own institution, which are bottom-up communities where you have a range of people from across the disciplines working in a really organic way, as, as um, Vinny referred to earlier, um, to share practice and to learn from what happens within the other disciplines. But the key is always, I think, how you then apply that within your own discipline. So I'm not suggesting for one minute that we can't learn from other disciplines or that we should silo ourselves in ways which um, create boundaries and barriers. Not at all. In fact, the opposite. Yeah. Um, I think we've got a huge amount to learn, and we do. Um, but the key is in applying that within our own disciplinary and teaching and learning context. And because practice is disciplinary based, we, ca yeah. we can't ignore that. Absolutely. We simply can't. Thank yeah. you, Fiona. Yeah. Um, John, I'm going to ask, I know you'll find this a very useful question in the light of your own convictions and ideology. Uh, a question has come in that says, should we not separate teaching and research? Are they not relying on different business models? Go for it, should, I be, should, should I be contained now or will I be taken in the way in the coast? I mean, you know, all I'll ask anybody is who inspired them most as, as anybody in this room. It's often somebody who is practicing as a good teacher but also as a researcher. Um, for me, I, I can only speak for me and I, I won't, gen I think, one without the other, it just doesn't exist for me. Uh, and I don't know if that's, and I think the danger we run is that we start to polarize difference when actually together we can have so much. And hence, you know, the, the approach that I'm trying to take in UCC is have an academic practice where we recognize that some people have a slightly heavier weighting of research and some have a high, slightly heavier weighting of teaching, but everybody's doing some research, everybody's doing some teaching. So what does that mean in practical terms is that we would not employ people purely for research. We would not employ people purely for teaching because we don't believe that represents the ethos of what we're about. You know? So that's, in a nutshell, what I think, what, it's about values, I guess, um, about what we value in education. I think that's a real common theme as well, yeah. declaring yeah. our ideology, yeah. um, stating our values, yeah. owning what's important to us um, as, a, as a sector and within our own institutions. Thank you, Thank you John. Um, Vincent, a global question for you, again, based on some of the really interesting insights, both pragmatic and ideological, that you brought to the debate. How can the disconnect between the teaching and learning on full-time on-campus programmes and that of online programmes be overcome? Yeah, if they have an answer. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think this is, a, this is a huge issue. And, and it was, uh, I suppose, I, I felt when I came to ID Schlager and known its, its reputation online that there would be more penetration. And, and I, so, it's, so why has that not happened? Like, you know, it is a key question. And I think it's an evolving one. But... Um, the structure in the in the IOTs is is around provision of X amount of of, of hours, and uh, and we've got so we've got to free up free up hours in that sector in order to allow people to do that. So even those that are committed and want to and have taken on the CPD aspects of it are finding it difficult to translate uh, to get the time to to make that translation. Uh, I don't think there's any major stumbling blocks to that, but I do think it is a time a time issue. So. From the strategic leadership point of view, it's how do you value this? How do you get it across that we value the time that it takes to, to make this transition? We value uh, the outputs uh, of that. How do we incentivize it? Because at the moment, the only level of incentivization really is, is to take some time out. But that, that time out in the IT sector is traditionally to go to research and not to course development as such. So it's, for me as a strategic leader, and I think in a wider sectoral thing is, how do you allow time for people to, to realize what they want to do? Because there are, it, there, there are you know, people know that there are advantages to it. They know that they would add value to their own face-to-face -face activities. Mm -hmm. They want to flip that classroom thing into, you know, I just don't want to be given this information. I want this student to have somewhere or other tried to assimilate the information, and now we're having a different conversation. Because it's more rewarding for me as a lecturer, as, as an academic, to be involved in that discourse than it is to be simply standing there giving information that is freely available, you know, on the Everywhere. internet. Yeah. And, you know, if I want to give a lecture in electrochemistry, well, you know, the Harvard, you know, people have it, have it up there, like, you know, so, so that, it's a waste, you know, it's not so much a waste of time, but it's, it's not maximizing the return from that face-to-face -face activity if the information already could be simulated elsewhere. So, so for, I think though there is an issue of, of time, 
uh, freeing up, but it's also, from a strategic point of view, valuing and incentivizing the outcomes of that, uh, recognizing that as a, a, a worthy pursuit for an academic. Again, another really common theme. I think we're really seeing a lot of complementarity to the views that came up. I, I don't want to let, I know we've picked Jim's brain enough as well, but I do think there's a really interesting question that arises from uh, his encouragement to focus on these international, uh, not just trends, but real potential of things like analytics. And a question has come in that says, how can the gap between the use and awareness of the potential of learning analytics be addressed, Jim? Any just quick insights on that? I know you've already talked about some of the international models and DISC's work, but is there something that we could be doing in an actionable way to, to start pushing that? Well, I mean, I'd strongly suggest that the, the forum would actually maybe organise an event around that. Um, you know, what, what will certainly, I mean, put the frighteners on people at the senior level in institutions is, I mean, they, 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 are, they, they are very, very attuned to um, anything to do with data protection, FOI, um, equality, various other bits of legislation that, that do tend to, to um, and rightly so, you, you know, pr um, put the wrap around in terms of the data that we are already collecting and holding. But, you know, this has, this has the potential to just go in all directions, you know, particularly if you, you know, if you, uh, but in another way, I mean, what, what educational technologists interested in learning analytics, I mean, will, will do, I mean, if it's in the context of their teaching practice, it's not necessarily different to a piece of educational research for which you would, there would be normal good ethical guidelines already in existence within HE, HEI. So I think it's a question of actually casting it into that, uh, in, into that frame. I mean, we have, the, we, we have the mechanisms to deal with this, but it's, it's coming at us very fast and there will be lots of sort of snake oil merchants out there selling apps and this and that and the other that, uh, that will gather this and analyze that. And all of a sudden, you know, you know, an institution's reputation will be exposed because somebody, for very benign reasons, starts to collect or do something that's maybe not <coughs> legal. Um, so, I, and and it, precisely because it's it, it's it's this interplay between things that are highly legal and highly reputational with things that are potentially quite exciting and very beneficial in the most benign way that they are used. Um, it, start, it really is, as I said, it's, it, at the moment it's like everybody's business and nobody's business and I think we need to just <coughs> just have an event that concentrates the mind and I think that would be the most tangible advice. Great. Thank you so much and I, I'm very conscious that you've, this has been a rather didactic um, session talking about all sorts of uh, important innovations that uh, move beyond that. But I think it's been really important to have a kind of um, a reflective, attentive audience listening to these different uh, leadership perspectives because they have really added value in a very substantial way to the debate that we're embroiled in right at the moment. I, he I hesitate to try to summarize the wide range of views and issues and insights that you've all shared ver via social media that, that our panel members have declared here. But I'm going to try, uh, because I do want to, to wrap this up before we, we hope, I hope you'll all be able to join us for refreshments and a bit more informal chat. Um, to Jim Devine for bringing an overview of the leadership and strategic perspectives through the work that it took to uh, produce the report. And for being quite, I think, um, consciously uh, provocative around the, the uh, critical light that we need to shine on some of um, uh, the, the uh, sector's dynamics, while at the same time recognising and endorsing the huge appetite and commitment and orientation to innovation that is out there in all of our institutions. Um, to Larry for inspiring us to see the curriculum. I've never quite seen the curriculum this way but as, as the kind of connective tissue between the skeleton of our quality frameworks and the heart and soul and flesh and blood of teaching practice on the ground. I think that's a really beautiful and useful metaphor. Um, and uh, to see again our curriculum as the opportunity to declare our ideologies and our philosophy and our ambitions for our students. Not the frameworks that support the curriculum, which are part of that, but the curriculum itself at the heart, um, I, th that, that notion of curriculum innovation that does all those things, I think is enormously powerful on this broader stage of teaching and learning enhancement and our more specific discussion today on digital capacity and the leader leadership perspectives that guide it. Um, 
I'm also hugely grateful to Mark for pushing us to think beyond our language, beyond the digital part of enhancement, and ensuring that we recognise the wider context of a morally pur purpose of purpose of purpose of vision for education, uh, for reminding us of what I think is used in, a, in more international settings than necessarily in Ireland, that concept of learning futures, uh, but also linking that to concrete suggestions about iterative <coughs> guidelines that really are pragmatic steps for equipping people, um, for giving people the tools and the uh, activities that can guide um, them on the specific part of this broader stage. Uh, to Fiona for, I think, bringing some really um, intelligent linguistic analysis to some of the work. I might be uh, trying to enlist her to do a bit more of that to help us look at what kind of common concepts and uh, terminologies are becoming associated with the discourse of our consultation, because that's terribly telling. I found it enormously interesting to hear her tabulate those, uh, that language, and perhaps then to challenge how that language is guiding the sector and, our, uh, and everybody within it. I think it was really useful to hear uh, the um, different levels of institutional perspective brought to bear on the discussion um, and a focus on the skill of the teacher and the concerns of the disciplines um, and how I think eloquently Fiona helped us to see that those different levels do lead uh, to a more uh, scholarly understanding, which I think also is a, at the heart of that, of, of what we all do. John, for reminding it that students must take strong leadership um, and play a collaborative role in, in building digital capacity, and they're absolutely key partners, and I think that's taken in as a given. And I, I would hate for the impression to be given that that's not the case, but we're shining a particular light today, obviously, on, on strategic leadership. I will take home with me diversity bestows stability. I love that that comes from John's own uh, disciplinary background, and I think also that we need to hear that message very strongly. I think the, when we are talking about, you know, don't forget we stand on territory uh, where we're all, we've all been subjected to unprecedented, unprecedented economic rectitude. Um, and that drives a kind, that does create a sort of an imperative for sameness and for a kind of vanillaizing the way we do business for because of the kind of concerns to do with economies of scale. I think we need to be very careful about that, and I think that John's message is uh, has been received loud and clear in terms of, of reminding us of that. Um, but uh, bringing research and teaching together also a key message from John. Vincent, who modestly talks about standing on the shoulders of giants, and I think also that, again, that really reflects his commitment to learning from expertise um, on the ground and within particular, uh, uh, within his own leadership position, um, but also recognising the pragmatic drivers for change, that this is not just a kind of, you know, change for the sake of it. There are real pragmatic reasons why uh, we have to grapple with um, the possibilities that digital technology bring uh, to teaching and learning, simply because of the changing nature of uh, demand and participation. Uh, not only because of that, but certainly that's a major driver, and I think that Vincent did very well to remind us of that. Um, and I, 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 again, one of my take-homes, it's not just about flexible learning, but it's also about flexible institutions. And there are particular challenges in that regard. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think it, it's been really useful to reflect on all of that. Coming back to Jim, who has raised our collective sites on some of the international issues that are of importance to us all, particularly, I think, the really interesting area of learning analytics. Uh, again, I think that ties together an awful lot of the uh, uh, more, more kind of vague notions out there that we could be doing more with technology. There's a perfectly concrete example of work that, that's ready to be at least interrogated by us in the, in the sector in a way that could be of value to everybody. So I, I think that this has been, as I say, a really rich discussion. I very quickly thank the forum team under Terry Maguire's extraordinary energetic leadership for coordinating this event. We would promise to squeeze every drop of wisdom out of the day in order to try to help to align these insights with what's coming out in the digital roadmap. Um, and for at risk of a little bit of flowery rhetoric that I know Mark has cautioned against, I think it is a cliché to, to say, perhaps, that we're standing on unknown territory, but I think it's also true. And that maybe Mark is right. We need to start, all we need to start with is a compass and a sense of adventure and a spirit.